everyone and welcome back to another Fantasy Author Lounge interview. This month we have an extended Fantasy Author Lounge interview because we have a special guest in the lounge. He is none other than the author of the Chronicle of the Unhewn Throne. He is a Gemmel Award winner, he is an R. Stabby Award winner and he's a multiple times Goodreads Choice Award finalist. That's right, if you haven't guessed already, it is none other than Brian Stavely. Let's hit it. Hey Brian, honor to have you in the lounge. How are you doing? Doing great. Doing great. It's Friday afternoon, making it into the weekend. Not that the weekend's <laughs> that different for me. It's like there's going to be more, more writing. It's just That's kind it. of all more of the same. But thanks for having me. Great to be <laughs> here. It's great to have you here. Absolute honor, like I said. For anyone who hasn't come across you, tell us about yourself. Yeah, sure. I, you know, I, I, uh, I write epic fantasy. My first book was The Emperor's Blades, which came out, I think, 2013. Um, and that, that was the start of a trilogy. And there's a standalone in that world. And then next week, um, I have a new book coming up. But maybe we'll talk about that later. Yeah, I live in, in the mountains of Southern Vermont. I have a nine-year-old son. And we spend a ton of time out in the woods, uh, you know, skiing, trail building, mountain biking, just generally taking advantage of everything that the beauty of Southern Vermont has to offer. So yeah, and it's fun. Like nine is such an awesome age because he's he's a legit adventure companion now. You know, oh, he, awesome. can, like, he can carry his own gear. He's actually a better downhill mountain biker than I am, which is a little embarrassing. <laughs> um, he's like, he rides in front of me and it like, he'll be dropping off stuff and he's like yelling over his shoulder. Did you hit it? Did you hit it? And I'm like, so, sort of, I went kind of <laughs> <laughs> as long as you're not in the bushes like i'd probably be <laughs> oh yeah yeah no I, I spend i spend some time in the bushes uh yeah. <laughs> that's I'm, I'm a more conservative rider than he is so that's prob probably good since i'm also you know 44 <laughs> no, that's, 44 good. that's fun though yeah so uh, you need that kind of young energy around <laughs> don't you sometimes mm -hmm. excellent totally Well, you've had incredible success with the Chronicle of the Unhewn Throne. And of course, you mentioned the standalone Skull Sworn as well. What do you think, just delving straight into the writing and into the books at the moment, uh, what yeah. do you believe has made your world and your characters so captivating? Uh, you know, I think that uh, my books are not high concept, right? If, if somebody comes to me and says, what are your books about? there's not just a one a one line thing that I can rattle off like you know if you, you think about wool you know the, the Hugh Howey book from mm -hmm. a long time ago it's like yeah. people live inside an underground bunker and nobody ever leaves unless they're expelled and when they do they go and they scrub the glass outside and you're immediately mm -hmm. like wait what why are they in an underground <laughs> bunker and then like what are they doing scrubbing the glass you're like instantly captivated mm -hmm. uh, and I'm always a little bit jealous of authors who have high concept books because you know, my books are more of the sort of sprawling epic fantasy tradition where if they're working and when they're working, I, I think it's a thousand little ingredients that are all coming together rather than one, one trick or one reveal or one um, reversal at the end that, that everybody's going to end up talking about. But that said, I think some of the elements that readers get back to me about again and again and again, people are interested in the Ketrol which are the special forces soldiers of my world. And, you know, the fantasy genre is replete with elite warriors of all different types, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I hadn't really seen a lot of a sort of modern special forces imported into the fantasy world, by which I mean people who are professionals, people who are specialized in their field. So my Ketrol, you know, there, there are medics, there are snipers, mm -hmm. there are demolitions experts, and they each train up in their own thing. Um, they have procedures and protocols, right? They have a, a codified sort of training. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I am not a military person, um, but I ha I'm an armchair historian and, you know, I, I, I like to read a lot of that stuff. And so I was like, I think there's a role, there's a space to, to write a kind of an army rangers or a Navy SEALs, but in a fantasy setting. Mm. Um, and so one of the things I really wanted them to have was a mode of transport, uh, you know, equivalent analogous to a helicopter so instead of giving them a helicopter i gave them these giant hawks so the awesome. kettle work in wings you know their teams are called wings of usually five sometimes six and they they strap into the talons of the hawk who's been taught to train with the talons hanging down mm -hmm. and um 
and yeah, they're they're the special forces soldiers. They drop in, you know, behind enemy lines. Um, they they do the assassinations and um, you know the the demolitions if they need to blow up a bridge, disrupt a supply train, something like that. Um, and I had a ton of fun writing them. The Emperor's Blades has a lot of their training because mm-hmm. the main Ketral characters are all cadets at that point. And then the later books has have the ones who survive mm-hmm. go on to you know to be professionals out in the field. And over and over again, people talk about how how much they like that part of the book. Um, you know, the new the new book, The Empire's Ruin, has a, a very large Ketral component, and people are like, "Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> how about a little bit more of that?" Yeah. Um, you know, I think another element that's that's been pretty popular is the system of magic, and mm-hmm. that's always a fun thing. I mean, that's one of the great delights of writing fantasy, right? Is that you get Definitely. to you get to sit down and come up with a system of magic and i wanted a system of magic i thought of it from the from the point of view of myself as the writer and things i wanted to be able to do with it so i wanted to be able to hide things from the reader that was one of my goals like Mm -hmm. before i even thought what the system of magic was i was like it needs to be mysterious in some way to the reader so each of the the you know the magicians in my world are called leeches because they leech Mm -hmm. power from the world around them Mm -hmm. and each of them has a different type of well so your well could be sunlight, it could be steel, it could be uh, the fear of other people. Um, mm-hmm. So there's a whole a whole range, but the leeches in my world are mostly hunted and persecuted because people are terrified of them for good reason. So they not only keep their existence secret, but they also, even among themselves, keep the nature of their well secret. Because obviously, if you're a sun leech, I know that if I'm going to come at you, I'm going to do it at night. Mm-hmm. You don't want me to know that. And so the leeches, you know, their world is filled with misdirection. And you might try to um, make it appear, even if you're a sun leech, like you're actually relying on steel, right? So people are like, Ben is always going everywhere. He's got all the steel armor on, even when he doesn't need it. He's got all these, you know, he has rings all down his ears. He's definitely a steel leech. Well, there's all kinds of misdirection uh, like that with the leeches, which leads to, has led to some really fun things for me as the writer because I want this to be a mystery for some of the readers they're like mm-hmm. okay for all the readers you know what what is this person drawing on you know that's it's like a little mystery within the broader scope of the book mm-hmm. and it, it sets up sort of dramatic dramatic scenarios um, I also wanted the system of magic to have for everybody to have weaknesses you know I didn't just want it to be here's the most powerful leech. And then there's sort of a ranking order, like a tennis ladder to the, the shittiest leech at the bottom. <laughs> but, um, you know, everybody is away from their well sometimes, you know, very few wells are, are everywhere. I guess mm-hmm. if, you know, something like nitrogen was your well or oxygen or <laughs> something ubiquitous in the atmosphere, then, then, you, then you'd, be, you'd be quite powerful, but I haven't written a leech like that yet. So, it sets it up so that it's not just, okay, you know, so-and-so is the most powerful and then, you know, she'll beat this person and he'll beat that person. But that at any given moment, anybody could be ascendant or anybody could be incredibly vulnerable. Um, and, and that leads you back to, to character, right? Because then it's not just a, a power ranking contest, but it, it becomes a question of who these people are, how they deploy their talents, how they ally with other people. So that's been another thing that people have, have commented on as something engaging and that they found a little bit a little bit unusual Mm. i'd say those two i think that's great i was gonna say there's just so much to uh even in just that quick kind of like breakdown of of the chronicle i'm just like there's so much that i want to know more about from there even just from a little little explanation i mean magic systems check (laughs) yeah yeah. warhawks is an absolute sell (laughs) so yeah yeah i mean those are just fun to write i mean it's just fun to write those those scenes and those battle scenes and the training Mm. i'm a sucker for a training montage. Like I just, oh, yeah. I like, you know, in, when I'm watching a movie, when I'm reading a book, I'm like, just bring it on. Just give me like 45 <laughs> chapters of, of the training. I mean, I try to, I try to limit myself in my own writing, but I love that shit. It's so hard to do a montage though, when you're writing, that's the problem. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Like the actual yeah. film montage with the sound of the, the music background and the- Yeah, the yeah. It's like, I wish there was a way of doing that in text. <laughs> Maybe there's a Don't way. Don't you kind of wish that you could, um, you could just like pop up behind someone who's reading your books and then just play a little music in their ear, yep. right? Like imagine fine. if you could do that. You're like, oh, you're on chapter 23? Hold on just a second. Yep. Okay, listen to this as you read. 
<laughs> I love that idea. And I think like audiobooks, I mean, obviously there's rights issues and things like that. There's yeah. obviously audiobooks with lots of effects and things like that and soundscapes yeah. in the background. But yeah, I mean, I've always done, I don't know about you, but I have uh, playlists, both uh, private and public for my writing that, you know, it's just, it, they, are, they are almost like a soundtrack. The, I wouldn't yeah. say play yeah. this at this bit, but it would work. Right, that's right. Where it, I wrote it's the mood. Yeah. yeah, it's the mood. So, do you can you listen to music with words when you write, or like? Depends. I, I listen to a lot of rock and metal, um, so yeah. the words do blend. Uh, just kind of blend into yeah. the actual overall sound a bit more than sure. like rap or something that's you know, sort yeah. of songwriting. So it's very. I'm very particular. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What about you? Almost, I can only listen to um, like classical or baroque music. Mm -hmm. It's very sometimes if I'm really in the zone and I've got music in the other room, I can listen to something with lyrics. Mm -hmm. But generally, those words and my words kind of like butt heads. But I really like listening to you know Bach or Vivaldi or something. Um, I got you know that stuff is is always kind of running in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I used I listen to. I think that's the first time we've had that level of classical music or that kind of like Bach reference in the in the lounge it's normally cinematic music so that's the first for the lounge which is awesome uh -huh. yeah, yeah. so I understand that as well because I listen to Thomas Newman and Ludovico Einaudi for example is just like two of the ones that are perfect for me and that's obviously soundscapes and film for one and then just modern yeah. classical piano music which is just yeah perfect. Glass. I mean I listen to a lot of Philip Glass oh yeah he's yeah, yeah he's, he's, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean, he's, he's sort of blending, right? He likes sort of modern classical, but also he does a lot of movie soundtracks because there is mm. something, uh, you know, propulsive, I think, about a lot of his piano. His oh, piano. I so. Yeah, I love that. I mean, that's the thing. You can just, you can almost leech to borrow your kind of magic. Yeah, system. yeah. You can leech from the music, can't you? <laughs> it would be awesome to have a music leech in the books. I haven't done that yet. And I'm not, I have like my own internal rules about what mm. types of things could be a leech as well. And I would need to, do some soul searching about whether music would qualify, but it would be a rad, that would be a kind of a badass well, right? Because be cool. it's pretty rare, yeah. there's not music around all the time, but you can also create your own music. So like, like what do you do? Bard mage almost. Yeah, like, yeah, I mean, or something. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, that, that, that bard mage idea is out there, it, on hmm. its own is out there, right? Like, isn't that kind of name of the wind, isn't he? Doesn't his power bit. come a little bit from music? I don't know, I haven't read yeah. that. Yeah, so you got a brand new book coming out in the sixth. Yeah, here I'll show you. We got yeah, here's like here's the U.S. Book. That's the U.S. cover. Yes, Art I by Rich that. Anderson. It's incredible. But here, I'm curious to get your your feedback on this. Here's the U.K. cover. I'll hide behind mm -hmm. them. Um, like it. totally totally different vibe, different yeah. feel. Um, also, check out the difference in size between these books. Oh, really? Yeah. They got different. They both hardbacks, so they both both hardbacks. Oh, wow. but look, the U.K. one is like. A, <laughs> A weapon. <laughs> yeah, that's a spider killer if I've ever seen one. <laughs> yeah, totally. That's um, amazing. Is, I mean, do we have, is, are you running out of paper in the US or is that is it just a, the I don't know. I, I would be fascinated. You know, I know that there are marketing decisions that go into this mm -hmm. and that, you know, it's, it's cheaper to shelve and store and ship a small book. Mm -hmm. you know, but a book like this, even if it's spine out, is taking mm -hmm. up a lot of room on a bookshelf. Exactly. So, you know, if this is at a bookseller, it's almost like it's face out. It's so fast, yes, right? Exactly. I mean, the difference is not that big. So, oh, my, yeah, and yeah. I, I have definitely had my eye drawn by just the size of a book on a bookshelf mm, before. Same. I'm not like, shit, that's the biggest book on the shelf. I'm curious about yeah. that. So <laughs> I would, I don't know. I'm not privy to those discussions. Nobody comes to me and says like, how, how fat do you want your book to be? But I like that's to believe good. that someone somewhere is like, doing something clever <laughs> yeah absolutely and definitely i mean i always find the kind of the difference between uk and us covers i mean i understand the choices behind it different markets different yeah. tastes yeah um but i tell you what it was only until because i'd seen both covers but for yeah. some reason i didn't put them together so i was oh, just okay. kind of sit, yeah i was like doing the research and i was just kind of looking at this one so i'd seen empire's ruin i think uh patrick patrick leo was showing yeah. them off the other day yeah. and they look yeah. beautiful mm -hmm. um and then i saw then doing the research i was like wait they're the same book so mm -hmm. i was expecting obviously richard anderson art um, yeah, I'm so glad yeah. that you've got that for the US. But I think they are both different shades of beautiful. To be honest, I love this the is, colors. Yeah, this is my artwork. favorite of the. This is my favorite UK cover yeah. that I've ever had. Um, mm. I think it's just like the old UK covers were cool, but they were like it's just somebody holding a weapon, and often they were holding the blade of the weapon. And I was like, it, 
it, it looks it looks cool, but I don't think it really captures the book. Mm -hmm. Like this, somehow, like the the lost weapon falling into mm -hmm. the ocean that like resonates with many things in the book. This mysterious continent in the background that mm -hmm. looks peaceful, but like also you can't really tell what's going on there. That resonates with the book, and just frankly, the, the scope of this like this is a big quest book, and mm -hmm. this. I feel like this just says like there's a big quest that's gonna yes. happen. So <laughs> I, I, I'm thrilled with this one. This is like I said, this is my favorite of the UK covers. Mm -hmm. But I mean, Rich, Rich's stuff is I know right, awesome. <laughs> right. I mean, just Gwenna yeah. getting it's, after it. Yeah, it's so good. I mean, all of the covers. I think my favorite. Uh, actually, I think my favorite could be the the new one, Empire's Ruin, because he just imagine uh, manages to inject so much movement into. Yeah. Yes. Static piece of artwork yeah, and yeah. without you know um not that he's not detailed but you know he's got very broad brush strokes and it's yeah. like stylized and it's just yet yeah, so detailed in itself yeah. i don't know how he does it <laughs> well, here check, check this out. i have the, i have this out here for a different reason check this out this is the cover of skull swan also rich mm -hmm. um this is peer she's an assassin but we talked and he sent me some sketches for a skull swan that were much more dynamic like gwenna right. from the empire's ruin Mm -hmm. And we decided, like me and my editor and, and, and the art directors, that no, this one where she's just, you can see the knife here and she's yeah, just in the alleyway. Just watching, waiting. It, it's, <laughs> it was more right for this book. So it just, it makes me amazed by him. He can really do it all. He's got yeah. this like super dynamic cover of Gwenna, you know, like bombing in onto the ship so and then scary. just like quieter, mm -hmm. you know, more, maybe there's more tension in the Skull Sworn cover. I just, I'm in awe of his work. I think he's amazing. Yeah, which is actually what drew me to your books originally is because the artwork, you know. Is that right? Yeah. You judge a yeah. book by its cover, whether we like yeah. it or not. And I mean, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell us all about it then. Empire's Ruin, obviously, shit goes down. It's uh, obviously a start of a new shit series. Shit goes as well. down. Yeah. Yeah. It, so it, <laughs> what can it, you so tell it, us? It's, um, it's, it's the start of a new trilogy. It is mm -hmm. set in the same world as the original trilogy in a Skull Swarm. Mm -hmm. um, but it picks up about five years after the end of the original trilogy. Um, and I've been getting a lot of questions online. People are saying, hey, can, is, is this a uh, appropriate jump in point? Like if I haven't read any of your books, can I read mm -hmm. this one or, or do I need to go back and read the original trilogy? And I, and I just ping this back to people, other people, readers and say, what do you think? And the, uh, the difference of opinion is amazing. Almost, I think literally everyone who has read the original trilogy and Empire's Ruin is like, you obviously have to read the original trilogy. Right. It's gonna, you're gonna miss so much, it's gonna be so much richer. You're a fool if you don't read the original trilogy first. But a ton of people have now come at this book, you know, the, the review copies of this book cold. They didn't, hadn't read the original trilogy. And every one of them is like, no, I thought it read great. I didn't, I wasn't confused. I knew it was going on. I wanna go back and read the original trilogy now, but like, Bring it on, let's go. So <laughs> beats the shit out of me, uh, whether you need to read the original trilogy first. I wanted it to be an entry point for new readers. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, that character on the cover, Gwenna, she's a character that exists all through the original trilogy. And so right. you know more about Gwenna <laughs> if you read those first three books. That's uh, it. Yeah, you get more of a sense of her character, yeah. So anyway, yeah. So in this book, there are some familiar characters from the original books, and there are some new characters. Uh, mm -hmm. and some some familiar settings and some entirely new settings um but it follows three three pov characters gwenna who is one of those mm -hmm. ketrol we were talking about earlier she's a special yeah. forces soldier and um it's interesting when i started out to write this book i wanted it to be like a fun romping quest novel where gwenna and her team go and just travel the world and take on the mission and yeah. you know blow up the bad guys and it was going to be quicker and and lighthearted it mm. did not end up that way <laughs> <laughs> so where, where we ended up <laughs> yeah. is that in the first chapter of this book gwenna and her, her wing are on a mission and it goes like totally wrong um and, and people die it's a disaster she's she's demoted she's fired from the ketrol um and you know it's a little bit of a spoiler, but it all happens in the first chapter, and that proved to be a much more interesting book for me to write. This person who has fucked up and fucked up badly and fucked up ways in ways that can't be fixed, and and to see her grappling with that and trying to figure out how to come back from that and if she can come back from that and if she wants to come back from that, mm. um, at the same time that she's still on the quest. That was my original idea. Um, but instead of it being like 
badasses go romp through the quest and you know win the win everything it's more like this broken person mm -hmm. trying tr trying to get through the mission but also trying to like not lose herself entirely um that's cool but that was that's that's Gwenna um mm -hmm. and then one of the other plot lines is um uh, there's a guy named Ruck and he is a priest of the goddess of love he's a priest mm -hmm. of the goddess Ira and, and in my world, they, those people are the closest thing to Christian in my world. Obviously, there's no there's no Jesus, there's no you know there's no Christian theology in my world. Mm -hmm. But their approach is very much one of um, tolerance, universal love, uh, nonviolence. Uh, ma many of them are um, they proselytize around the world, and sometimes they're they're martyred because people you know don't want somebody they want a missionary in their town. Um, so he's a priestess of the goddess of love, but he has a very dark backstory. Um, he has some, he, ha he has a lineage and some powers that are really incompatible with being a priest of the god of love. And he hates that part of himself. He has this dark part of himself that he's been trying to shove away by, by moving towards this gentle religion. But he is um, thrown into a gladiator camp where he, his choices are like, are you going to fight or are you going to let yourself be martyred? What are you going to do? How much? How how much do you believe in your faith? Um, what are you willing to take? So he, he's a plot line, and then the third plot line is this uh, this guy who's a monk, sort of a mm -hmm. the Shin monks. They train in like meditation and emptiness, and uh, but he's also he used to be a, when when he was an orphan when he's a kid he was a, a thief and a criminal, and he decides to go back to that, and he's like you know all that stuff I learned as a monk that's pretty useful if you want to be a high level <laughs> criminal, like he has amazing powers of memorization and retention and observation, bodily discipline, all that stuff. The monks didn't teach him that so he could go back and scam people, but he has concluded that that's what he's going to do with his training. So these are all people, all three of the characters are people who are in sort of in conflict with their past and with their identities you know mm -hmm. we got the guy who's a monk but he wants to use that to be a criminal the guy who's a, a priest the goddess of love but it is like that's totally not applicable to fighting yeah. in the arena and we've got this soldier who has come to distrust all of her martial impulses mm. i love that <clears throat> just like a collection of broken people or people mm -hmm. really struggling with themselves which is I think that's great. I mean, I can't wait to get a copy. I really can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that's what it out to be. It was a long trek from like the lighthearted quest novel that I thought that I was going to write. <laughs> that's great. I think I, people, I mean, quests, if that is, you know, um, just in the, in terms of a descriptor of a book or a story, you know, a wild quest, this happens, that happens. We yeah. have the sort of the band, almost like a D and D approach. That's right, yeah. almost an instant selling point for me on a book as well. Oh, I love um, a so good. It's book. awesome to hear. Yeah, I think a lot of people are doing quests. <clears throat> Excuse me, I just finished one off, and it's coming out in a month. And um, yeah, I did the same thing where I was like, "This is going to be a small quest," and I just went. <laughs> just well, once you're on the quest there's like more stuff to see there's exactly. like places to encounter monsters to fight oh, what, what's it. the title of that book then uh heavy lies the crown yeah so it's coming how out. is so so i read um the iron keys just this morning just in oh, preparation <laughs> yeah, yeah no i just wanted yeah it was great um how is that book related to the iron keys i, I my sense so, so i have the the emanesca series which is yeah, my main yeah, horse, um, yeah, original yeah. series so right. that's a prequel to that where it just uh, tells Farden sort of like 10 years ago, the main character, mm -hmm. Farden, as you know. Um, and then, yeah, the new series that's coming out is or has come out is the Skeleton Chronicles, which yeah. is set 20 years. So it's almost what you're doing. Similar, yeah, yeah, after, right. And yeah. it's an entry point as well, but it's not. So it has a what has come before section at the start of the book, just to kind of, without spoilers, bring people up to speed. So like Farden's yep. obviously in the, these new books. And uh -huh. you're thinking like, oh, who is he? Who's just this kind of like awesome mage for no background? So yeah, that's it. So that so this is kind of like an origin story for him. Iron Keys, yeah, little tiny yeah. origin uh, origin story. It's kind of fun. So that was him um, dealing with just kind of his own. He's very impetuous, right. and he always is. And that was just a little honest. right. Yeah, he rushes out to, to face the Minotaur. Yeah, that's it. yeah. And now yeah. we've kind of come full circle, and now we have a main one of the main characters in the group is a giant Minotaur. So yeah, oh, cool. Rushed. One of my favorite characters. One of my friends has said it's literally Chewbacca, and please don't kill her. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and now I can't. I want to. I can't. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah. Well, I like you know I like something like what Joe Abercrombie does, which is that there in a way a lot of his books are standalones. I don't mm -hmm. know if you know his stuff, 
but yeah. you know they're all in the same world and so you know certain character will come in and then disappear for a few books but then they'll mm -hmm. show up later in a different context yeah i love that that's, yeah. that's appealing to me yeah it's kind of neat that's it he's created the world and created the, yeah. the franchise you could say and it's just yeah uh, exactly the stage is perfect i think you've done exactly that because obviously you're going to a completely i've seen the map and it's just the map in the empire's ruin just has this big black splotch or blank yeah I should say. yeah yeah isn't that right yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, we, were, we spent a long time, like I was chatting with my editor about like what to do with the map. And uh, I didn't want a, you know, this book has a ton of maps. I was joking with somebody that by the end of my career, my books are just going to be all maps because we just That's add, a new, we, we, get, we add a new map every book, right? And so it just, cool. yeah, yeah. but, um, but I, I really didn't like looking at a fully fleshed out map because mm. for me, the appeal of going on a quest it with it, you know as a reader is that you're going into the unknown mm -hmm. and having a map right there at the opening it's like well here's what here's the territory exactly what you're going to face <laughs> like I, I don't know that diminishes that feeling for me but at the same time the, the, you know there is a physical map in the book and i wanted there to be some kind of indication of what they were doing so we came up with this solution, which I'm really pleased with, where the map is just schematic and it, it is literally the map of their voyage. So you mm -hmm. only see the places on this new continent where Gwenna and the people she's with actually go. The rest of it is blank. You don't know yeah. what's there. And then I put in the um, the key. Like, let me let me just look at it. Like yeah, some of the key events it. are labeled on the map. I don't know. If, I don't know if people can see it, but let me. Try. Yeah, here here it is. Yeah, yeah I love that. But you can see it's not it's not really filled in. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, I put in key things. So there, there are events marked on the map that say like throne ships, Selengo, Hamaksha, City of Skulls. Ooh. Now those all mean things. And once you read the book, you're like, of course, that's what you would label it. But I wanted those to be like little promises to the reader that like mm -hmm. stuff is coming. And, and those are like teasers, you know, people, I hope people looking at the map will be like, well, what, what's the blind? You know, what are throne <laughs> ships? What, it, what's that about? Exactly. So, yeah. That was it. Was a really fun map to actually think about and conceptualize. Yeah, I think it's it's unlike. I mean, I'm huge into my maps. I just love any cartography yeah. video and map making yeah. video. Oh it's yeah, it's yeah. the first thing when I pick up a book. Does it have a map? Yes, right. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that there's some some maps I've seen exactly like you say during a quest they'll have the dotted lines sometimes with multiple characters so you're not yeah. going to know where they end up how they get there and even though you yeah. don't know it i agree completely it's a little bit of a spoiler and so yeah what can yeah. you tell us about the land of menkidok it's not it's not a place you'd want to go on vacation oh, um, <laughs> it's the whole almost the whole place is horrifically poisoned um and uh I don't want to reveal because the, the book will explain how, how that came to be eventually. But yeah, it, it the whole place is twisted and poisoned. So there are living things there, but they're all monstrous. Um, and, you know, even the grass, like there's there's a scene where they're, the, the characters are walking through just a big, a big field, a grassy field with like knee high grass. And then they realize that the grass is like, has little serrated blades on it and is wrapping around their legs and is Ooh, like cutting it cutting into their legs uh, and there are you know there are trees like willow trees but that just have human hair um Ooh, tree. hanging from them yeah. so just like all kinds of and th that's like some of the more benign stuff that they encounter there it's just the whole place is busted and anybody who goes in there it's it, you know it's very bad for your your mental and physical health so um yeah it's a tough it's a it's a tough place to have to travel to and especially to have to travel through um and uh and my hope is that the exterior environment and the in the conflict and tension and terror of the exterior environment is complementary to a lot of the things that are happening within the character specifically within some of the main characters mm -hmm. uh, you know there's sort of an objective correlative there between you know the world and the psychic state of of the characters as they try and survive. I think it's it's really interesting when you, like for instance, you've managed to make the world itself 
perhaps a character or a villain in itself. Yeah. And yeah. I love yeah. also when it, even if it's not characterized, obviously it doesn't speak and have, and have lines and dialogue. No, 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 but yeah. It's an entity that you fear and it is constantly in play within the book, it sounds like. And, it, and it's not inert, right? Yeah, you don't, you don't, yeah, I didn't want it to be a, either a continent or a city. I didn't want those things to be inert, just stages where the characters mm -hmm. move around, but rather, you know, dynamic uh, mm -hmm. and responsive to the actions of the characters themselves. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I hope I hope I succeeded in that. Sure <laughs> you know, we'll yeah, find people, out, I'm sure. Yeah. Folks who have read it said some people say Minkitic and the and the scenes there remind them of Predator, the first Predator, um, okay, yeah. which I was thinking of consciously. Yeah. Some people said it reminds them of Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer. Great, uh, great filming. Yeah. Which I was also thinking of consciously. <laughs> um, I, I had a number of reference points. Um, you know, I obviously wanted to do my own thing, but I like to be aware of when other people have tried to do similar stuff. Um, and so, you know, I, I had a number of reference points for Mankitic when I was thinking about what do I want? How do I want to feel? How do I want to look? Um, so that's really cool. I'm getting when you said grass now, I know it's probably slightly off, but I immediately got a uh, lost world. Jurassic Park as Jurassic Park yeah. Lost World vibes with yeah. the long grass and the, the uh, yeah, Lost sure. is running through it. Absolutely. Yeah. I didn't think of that <laughs> but that's uh, you're yeah you're right on i love that yeah just sort of the world is going to kill us if we don't keep moving basically love that. exactly time's yeah. running out <laughs> yeah yeah and and the way that there's this corrosive effect that that a um you know a dangerous environment has a corrosive effect on the psyches of the people who are moving through it right mm. the, the environment and the world is one danger but the longer you stay in there the more messed up you are um you know and so um, you know, I was also thinking a little bit of Apocalypse Now, mm -hmm. it's a little bit, it, you know, yeah, I, it, yeah. I, I tend to think a lot in terms of other other books and movies and stories, mm -hmm. you know, I, I like trying to consciously situate my own storytelling within all this other excellent storytelling that's mm -hmm. out there and think like, well, I want to do a little bit of that, but I want it different. I want to do this mm -hmm. my way slightly. So um, I like it. Yeah. Yeah, well, let's talk about that in terms of inspiration, because I kind of want to get onto the writing side of things as well. So mm. where do you, I mean, you mentioned film, TV and other books there, but what do you, where does most of your inspiration come from? Um, it's a difficult question because it's different places. <laughs> well, I'm going to, I'm not, I'm going to answer it in a slightly oblique way. I don't know if this is where most of my inspiration comes from, but it was a thing that I was thinking about um, and that I think about a lot, but just before I, I got on this call, um, I did my my undergrad and graduate degrees in creative writing, but I wrote poetry. And so I spent, you know, like five years of my life just voraciously reading all this poetry and writing poetry. And, you know, one of the poetic traditions that impacted me most strongly was this Anglo-Saxon, old Anglo-Saxon poetry, which mm -hmm. is written in this these four beat alliterative lines. So they have very strong stresses. You know, this is what Beowulf is written in. Um, right really strong stresses and those stresses are accented through alliteration um mm. so you, and there are different patterns i won't bore you with all the academic but there's different patterns yeah. in which you can deploy you know you can have like two and two you know like two f's and two l's in a line mm. and you know or you can have three and one um right. and uh you know and then, and then there are you know much later poets in the tradition of English poetry who have sort of worked in this like Hopkins Gerard Manley Hopkins is is a, a major example, um, like you know he has a famous poem called the Wind Hover that goes, I caught this morning morning's minion kingdom of daylight's dauphin dapple dawn drawn falcon and his riding of the rolling level underneath him steady air so you can you can hear how it's just like propelled forward um, by uh, mm. both the both the accents and the alliteration and i find that happen that happens to me literally every sentence that i write like the first thing that comes up now this isn't an inspiration in terms of the overall scope of the story but this is like what propels it sentence to sentence so like i just have this is just like some random shit that i was working on for the new book today um i think you'll hear like in the beginning just the first couple sentences you'll hear it a little bit in here Hua knelt in the crumbling dirt just at the edge of the latrine pit, like some kind of shit worshiper, she thought, like a good meek little priestess of piss. 
And it's like one of the things in there is this short I sound that, that's we've got the I in pit, the I in shit, and the I in piss. And then we also have the P, mm -hmm. the, you know, this, this plosive, this bilabial plosive in pit, priestess, and piss. And I'm not doing that on purpose. I'm not like, hmm. ooh, I want to I wanna have like three P's in this sentence. Hmm. But those, you know, it, it's like when I try and like peel back and see what is happening in my brain when a sentence comes out, mm -hmm. that's so often what is happening. And then there's a there's a there's another layer where I'm like, well, wait, is that actually the word that I want? Like maybe maybe that's mm -hmm. just totally wrong. And I don't think my my writing reads like a, a, a festival of alliteration. That's that's not my goal. Mm -hmm. But it's fascinating to me, like just to to see that. I mean, I haven't written that kind of poetry in 20 years, but it's Please still do. like, it's still, it's just there, you know, mm -hmm. these, these like ligatures of sound that, mm -hmm. that tie one syllable to the next and propel a line or a sentence from one word to the next. Um, they're just like lurking back there. <laughs> um, it's a true thing about my writing that I, that I think is interesting. I think it's mm -hmm. sometimes it is an urge to be resisted, right? It's like, mm -hmm. I'm not, nobody's going to buy my books if I'm writing like Hopkins. Um, you know, nobody bought Hopkins' books when Hopkins was alive. <laughs> so it, it, it's not like something that I'm aspiring to, but it's just like this little engine that's running mm -hmm. constantly. And another engine that's running, I mean, I'm most attracted to that, but then like, you know, iambic pentameter, which, you know, is the rhythm of Shakespeare, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. Mm -hmm. often I'll find when I get to the end of a chapter, the last line or the last couple lines will, will drop into near perfect iambic pentameter, right. which I, again is a thing that I need to resist, but it, it comes from that poetry background where yeah. I wrote a lot of formal poetry and, you know, you, you come to the close of a sonnet, a Shakespearean sonnet, where it has this couplet and iambic mm -hmm. pentameter. It's, it's just kind of, like, I'm curious. I just want to look at the end. Like, I'm just grabbing yeah, yeah, it. This is fascinating. I don't know. I mean, I, this might not work. Maybe this isn't going to be the case. Um, well, so this isn't. So this is the last line. Well, that's a that's a spoiler, I guess. <laughs> I was going to say, be careful with what you're reading. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think it's too much of a spoiler. Um, this is the last line of Skullsworn. It's not iambic pentameter, but you'll hear the 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 alliteration in it. The drool. Yeah. I hope this finds you well, my son, child of my doubt and my delight. Your heart full of life, your mouth still brimming with song. And it's not strong. It's not super strong, but mouth doubt, um, doubt and delight. You know that mm -hmm. the dd and then the mm -hmm. ow ow sound. Um, it's just like all always doing that, and I don't. Again, I don't think that this is necessarily a strength. Uh, like it's not it's something that I try to resist, but mm -hmm. that that old Anglo-Saxon tradition and then the more continental accentual syllabic tradition, um, they're both they're both all just up in my business all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm fascinated by the actual kind of uh, you know the technical side of it, and obviously you know the, yeah. exactly what you just said. Um, I find it. I mean, because I've I haven't studied to the, the length that you have. Um, but I find that I, I really appreciate that type of writing and maybe it's kind of instilled in us from, you know, the last several hundred years of sure, you know, absorbing sure. that and it's kind of yeah, informed yeah. popular culture. But I love rhythm and staccato mm -hmm. rhythm and sort mm -hmm. of dividing up a sentence as you would be. Yeah, well, and I mean, and and it's all, you know, it's, I mean, it's such a fun, it's such a fun job writing books because it's the best job in the world. <laughs> we're not even talking, we're not even talking about right now world building or characters or description or narration or point of view, which are like all we could spend hours talking about, just like the, just the language and the sound of the language, mm. you know, mo moving between short sentences and long sentences yeah. and the deployment of those. Um, yeah. And, and I don't know, I feel like there's like a little tuning fork for me where I won't say I got it right, but I got it right for me. And I'll, I'll be like, this paragraph sucks. This paragraph sucks. And I'll rewrite it and I'll move it and do it and rewrite it and do it and do it. And then like the tuning fork vibrates. I'm like, okay, I can leave that alone. Now. Yeah. And it's not, it's not gonna be right for every reader, of course. Um, but it's, I, I get it to a point where it, it doesn't hurt my head to read it to myself. <laughs> Let's talk about more uh, more of the writing then, because I think it's, it's really interesting your kind of take on this. So what is important to you within fantasy or within your kind of fantastical world? And what do you believe we need to see more of in fantasy as we kind of 
you know, progress and evolve the genre forward? Well, I, for me, it, fantasy, it's all about the characters. And I think that, I think most everybody would say that, you know, I, I mean, for all that I love a, a continent spanning quest or a, a cool magic system or some, some special forces soldiers, I've read books that I think have really neat ideas that I just put down because I, the character is not commensurate with with the plotting or with the conception that the author had. And I've read books where I'm like, there's really nothing going on in this book at all, but I am so enamored of this character or this character's mm. voice. And then of course the books that really kill it for me are, are the books where those two things um, combine and they, and mm. they work together. Um, so I don't know if there's, and I, I guess I also have, you know, coming back to, to Bach and Baroque music, um, I'm not necessarily trying to be a groundbreaker. And I, you know, there, there's plenty of people, you know, Shostakovich, Stravinsky, you know, who were groundbreaking. But what I like are people who are working, and this is also my poetry background, who are working again and again with, with these sort of established forms, whether it's um, a fugue in music mm -hmm. or a, a sonnet or a villanelle. Um, but that they're doing, they managed to find it and make it new and do something new with it. Um, and it, it, I think that's almost always in the details. It's, it's I, I'm, I'm innately suspicious of big showy things like, I'm writing my sonnet, except instead mine has 28 lines instead of 14 lines. I mean, there are double sonnets, but whatever. Like, I, I'm like, okay, that's kind of a party trick. Like, write mm. me your sonnet and just do it, do it new which is so hard, right? You, you, you're up against Edna St. Vincent Millay, you're up against Shakespeare, you're up against Frost, right? You're up against these, these titans of mm. poetry, but that's kind of the fun. Like I wanna go in there and play in that, in that ground. Um, if you're gonna write a fugue now, well, you're probably not gonna write a fugue better than Box Fugue. So <laughs> like I, my hat is already off to anybody who's, who's trying to write a fugue. Um, and so in my writing, I want to, I don't know that there's like an entirely new thing to do. Mm. I think there's just the old stuff that can be made new and be made better. We, you know, one example of that that's like, like super obvious to everybody now, I think, is that fantasy was really reliant on Northern Europe for a long mm -hmm. time. Mm. Fine. I love a lot of those books, <laughs> but like, let's, let's do some more fantasy that's not reliant on northern europe um you know like michael fletcher has his his series that's sort of mesoamerican inspired mm -hmm. and uh nora jemison has that series that duology that's sort of uh egyptian inspired and mm -hmm. you know people are doing all kinds of stuff shelly parker chan mm -hmm. has a book coming out i think right now um, she became the sun yeah yeah which is yeah. like you know inspired by the ming dynasty like mm -hmm. awesome now is that like a totally different thing or is it just is it just br making the world larger and bringing more influences, more people, more types mm. of character, more types of cultures into it? I, I think that that's, that's what I'm excited to see. That's what I'm excited to read, honestly. Mm. Um, and and, and not, not that I won't go back and like, if somebody's got some awesome Norse thing, I'm gonna read that too. Um, but I just like it, I like it when the, well, but I like it when the world gets bigger, right? Yeah. It's, not, yeah. it's not that I wanna move from one place to another place. It's not like, no, I don't want to read Europe. I want to read Sub-Saharan Africa. It's like, I would like to read Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa. Exactly, um, yeah. So in addition to not in replacement of or in place. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Bring on the expansion of fantasy, essentially. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we're, honestly, I think we're living in a golden age. I mean, I cannot keep up. Agreed. I mean, I don't, I don't, <laughs> yeah. have to read, I don't read as much as I'd like just because kid and skiing and mountain biking and <laughs> mowing the lawn and yeah. you know all the shit that you need to do to be an adult <laughs> um doing the dishes doing the lawn yeah, yeah. Uh, but but there's so much out there that's so exciting um i mean i i sort of am looking forward to like a quieter old age mm -hmm. where i just get get to like go back and crank through it all yeah. you know and be that's a, it's gonna be great I mean, I probably will. You, you never get through it all, but just um, I, it's ironic that now that I do, you know, I've been writing full time for you know a bunch of years now. But I read 
less than I than I ever did at any other point in my life. Same. Yeah. It's the writing right. as well. Do you I find think. that as well? Do you find yeah. that as well? Oh, yeah. my TBR just keeps growing. It's, it's like three books added, zero books taken away. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. Right, right, right. It's more like 300 added because, I mean, the pace right. of the market is so fast now. I mean, books yeah. are coming out at, right. at a faster rate, both from traditional and indies in general. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so totally. I just think it's, it's, you could actually be an elf and never, you know, a Lord of the Rings, immortal elf, yeah. and never yeah. get through the book because it's coming out faster than most people can read. It is. And I'm yeah. a slow reader. And yeah. then there's the writing, you know, I, yeah. um, but also I had this yeah. weird thing where I'm going to absorb someone else's style. <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. know what it is. I don't know if you get that. My solution to that is to try to read like a lot of different thing like I, I even though i don't read a lot a lot and i don't read quickly i have maybe like four or five books going at the same time so like right now i have um i'm finishing this book about the donner party i have mm -hmm. this, this book by katie mack uh, this astrophysics book about like the end of the universe it's not it's nonfiction. um uh i'm reading christopher buhlman's black tongue thief um get around to that one uh, I'm reading Binti by Nnedi Okorafor. Like I have like a number of books and maybe this is why I go through them so slowly because I'm, I'm, you know, ping ponging between them. But I think that that, mm. that keeps me from falling into like the, uh, the gravity well of somebody else's voice. I need to be very careful with David Mitchell, both because his voice is, I think, really strong, which is a weird thing to say because he's kind of a ventriloquist, but like there's yeah. something about him that's hypnotic. And I just think he's so brilliant that I, I read a book of his and I'm like, fuck, I should just let him write the books. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it's so funny, back on that, not every book is for every person. I remember going to, I forget which con it was, something in Boston. And I had just read The Bone Clocks, which, which was a David Mitchell book, which had just come out at the time. And I was in like kind of a funk. I was like, shit, David Mitchell's amazing. I should mm. like just send him some plot ideas and let him do it. Um, <laughs> Just give you 10 and, and I was sitting at the bar with a group of people who had all read or tried to read the bone clocks and they all hated it. It was, it was astounding. It was like, it was like hanging out with a group of people who hated King Lear, um, which I, <laughs> which I have also done to be honest. Um, but, but it was, I didn't, I found it ultimately liberating and wonderful because I was like, mm -hmm. okay, all right, not, it's not just David Mitchell's not just the best. He's just the best for me. Um, yeah. But yeah, so there are authors that I am wary, that I'm wary of. But you know, I think, tell me if you feel this way. I used to feel, I guess I still feel that reading is kind of like being lazy. I'm like, if I have time, I should write. And yes, reading exactly feels self-involved. Right. Yeah. But I've started to try to, to, to open the day by, by reading for just mm. like half an hour. Um, mm. Just with the idea that, no, no, I, I, I believe intellectually, that reading is part of writing and reading right. is how you get better. And I and usually I feel like it, it catapults me into my day and I have a better writing day if I've read first, but it still feels totally self-indulgent. I'm like, shit, I'm here. I am. This is a work day and I'm out on the deck with my feet up reading a fantasy novel. It doesn't feel like work. Yeah. It doesn't, it, should, it feels like you're cheating. <laughs> it feels like you're cheating. It feels like yeah. you're cheating. But I think, I try to tell myself, and I'm going to try and tell you that I think it's important. I think we should both do it. Yeah, I think it's I okay. <laughs> Give us permission. To do it. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's like when one day you would just spend a whole, I don't know, just staring out into the forest for you and me just staring at a high rise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just thinking things through in your head. Just think yeah. if A happens, what does B do? If C happens. And then you can spend a whole day literally sat staring at a wall, but it's yeah. work. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, right, right. Yes, yeah, absolutely. You really have to convince yourself of it. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's always good. I do like a lot of I do a lot of trail running and trail racing, and it's the same thing with rest days with training. Right. You when you feel behind. Right now, I feel very behind with my training, and I'm like, I should just run like every day, like three times a day. But mm. but no, the resting <laughs> is necessary. Like <laughs> exactly like you're describing, it's necessary to the process. It's your body needs to rebuild, but it does not feel when you get to the rest day, like that's what you should be doing, no. especially when you're, when you're, you know, behind where you should mm -hmm. be behind all your targets. So yeah, yeah, I don't know. Life lessons that I'll probably still be trying to absorb when I'm yeah. 80, 90. That's it. I mean, that's the thing we've got the writing bug. And also once you've 
find once you've written something or you found the love for writing, you can't stop. You know, and it's stories yeah, yeah, and stories yeah. just keep bubbling up. Yeah. Like I've got this yeah. book somewhere around here that's just half full of ideas. Uh -huh. I will never write that I'm going to have to give to someone before yeah, <laughs> yeah, I disappear yeah. off this more. Yeah. Right. But I, they're there and I just yeah, love to get through them. But it's just that it's an obsession as well as a job. And I think yeah. it's just great fun. <laughs> uh, no, it's awesome. I mean, yeah. I feel so lucky to, to be able to do it. It's amazing. Exactly. And doing it in Vermont as well, of all places, which is not yeah. bad at all. <laughs> it's quite lovely. It's quite lovely here right now. <laughs> Well, I tell you what, Brian, this has been so fascinating, so interesting. Uh, we've re really explored some things that we haven't kind of uh, explored in the lounge yet, even with good. Okay, for good. a year now, which is fantastic. So yeah. tell you what, let's round off with, obviously, where can people find The Empire's Ruin? Uh, where can people find you if they want to obviously find out more about you and your books? So my, I have a website. It's it's just brianstavely.com. Uh, you, you know, if you just Google Brian Stavely, yeah. you'll find the way to it. I'm on Twitter. <laughs> not on Facebook. I finally got off Facebook. That felt very, very challenging and then very delightful. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, for the books, you can get them kind of everywhere. Um, you, you know, the obvious, the obvious place that starts with an A. But um, also, I have a local bookstore here in Wilmington, Vermont. It's like just mm -hmm. 15 minutes down the road. And if you want signed copies of my stuff, you can uh, go to Google Bartleby's Books, Bartleby's Books in Wilmington, Vermont, and um, they have a website, and you can you can say how you want the book signed, and um, I go in there periodically and, and sign a bunch of stock, and uh, and people, boy, people have some very specific requests. I had I had a guy who wanted like a hawk feather tucked between page seventy seven and seventy eight. So like on Twitter, you mentioned yeah, that on Twitter, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean. I can't, I can't promise the world, but I'll, I'll do my best. And I'm willing to entertain more outlandish requests than just like, like you know, can you sign, can you sign and date my book? What's yeah, that? I was going to say, as long as it's not send nudes. I mean, that's, that's where we want. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, probably, I probably I won't do that. Maybe well, that'll be a special giveaway someday. Um, <laughs> that's it. Uh, yeah, once I get my OnlyFans account up and running, yeah, uh, <laughs> you can monetize. So can monetize. <laughs> yeah, but no. So Bartleby's is is a great place if you want to sign if you want to sign copy, awesome. and I and I love it. It's like such a cool relationship. They do an awesome job. That they've been doing this for me for years, and they know like a lot of people who who call in regularly, <laughs> and That's they're like, cool. so Glenn needs his sign first, and this yeah. guy wants you know you remember yeah. like. Oh, That's awesome. Know. That's what yeah. I love about indie bookshops, though, right? <laughs> oh, they're amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. So, you know, Amazon, Amazon's great. And, and, and I, I use Amazon all the time. But if you want a personalized touch, Bartleby's in Wilmington, Vermont. Excellent. We'll get all these links up and make sure that people can get them. And cool. uh, is binding, uh, broken binding in the UK doing something? Yeah, yeah. yes. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for mentioning that. Yeah, because I'm in the US, I'm like always sort of just US centric. But yeah, broken binding is doing all the signed copies in the UK. They've been amazing. They've got them in like wrapped in the protective wrapping. Oh, and uh, they're, they're book plate signed copies, which some people think are great. Some people are like, I don't want the book plate. So, um, you know, your mileage may vary. But yeah, Broken Binding is doing the signed copies in the UK and um, Bartleby's in the US. Excellent. Yeah, we'll get all the links up, Brian. Again, thank you so much for uh, dropping by the lounge. I hope it's been fun as well. And thank oh, you. Oh, it's been such a pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, it's been amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate right. it. Cool. Well, good luck with the book launch. And uh, yeah. If you're watching, go get it, and we'll be back next month with another interview, another author. Take it easy. See ya.